I'm pleased to announce our keynote speaker, Richard Jimerson, CIO of Erin. Uh, Richard has been actively involved in internet resource governance and education since the 1990s. As Chief Information Officer at the American Registry for Internet Numbers, his focus is on the community engagement to ensure all registry services and systems meet the needs of erring customers. Richard has, been, has built community engagement programs and services for both Aaron and the Internet Society over the last 15 years with recent focus on the importance of industry-wide IPv6 deployment. He has communicated with thousands of companies about their adoption of new technology and is a strong advocate of open internet standards. Thanks, Agi. Yeah, thank you. And there we go. Hello, everybody. My name's Richard. I am with Aaron. I'm very happy to be here with you this morning to talk to you about a very important topic, IPv6. I see a lot of people in the room that have done a lot more with IPv6 than I have. Um, also see a lot of people in the room that I haven't met before. And uh, hope we can have a good conversation today. I'm going to start out by walking our way a little bit through the history of what we've done at Aaron, one of the five regional internet registries with IPv6 basically talk a bit about what the experience was like from a registry perspective over the last 15 years. I'm also going to provide some standard deck information that we do at all types of conferences that provide information about how to get your resources from Aaron, where we are with IPv4 depletion, those types of things, because I know that those are very important topics to everyone. At the end, if there are any questions, I'm happy to ask or answer any questions that you have. And they could be questions about anything. They could be about IPv6. And if I don't have the answer for it, somebody else in the room probably will. Um, or they could be about uh, Aaron's registry services. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have about that. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So first of all, uh, many of you may not be aware of the regional internet registry system. Let me just talk a minute about that. There are five of us. We're all nonprofit organizations. And all we do is manage the distribution of the internet number resources for our region. They're broken out into major continental areas. Aaron is the American Registry for Internet Numbers, and we service Canada, the United States, and many nations in the Caribbean. And then there are four other regional internet registries. You probably heard of RIPEN CC. They're over in Europe in the Middle East. Uh, the Asia Pacific Network Information Center, they service all of the Asia Pacific region. AFRINIC for the entire continent of Africa, and LACNIC for all of Latin America and portions of the Caribbean as well. So you're probably wondering, well, if you're the registry, how many people have actually registered IPv6 address space? Thousands of organizations have already come to the registry and received their IPv6 address space. That doesn't mean that all of them are announcing the space and all of them are using the space today. But it means that they had a plan to start with, and they came in and they got those resources. And at Aaron, um, if you haven't received your IPv6 address space yet, we do have policies, distribution policies for service providers, community networks, end user organizations. You could basically be any type of organization and have a need to connect to the IPv6 network. And there's likely a policy that will suit your needs uh, inside Aaron to get your address space directly from the registry. So, as all of you know, uh, we're here preparing for IPv6. And we've been doing this for years at this particular conference, and you've been doing it at other places uh, over the years. But one of the good pieces of news about IPv6 is, of course, there are a lot more addresses. A lot of people early on, they ask, well, what's, what's the real advantage of IPv6 over IPv4? And people struggled quite a bit with the answer early on. I mean, the, the, the big answer was, well, we're running out of the IPv4 addresses, and uh, we're not going to have uh, more of them soon, and you're going to need to connect uh, your customers to the network, and you're going to have to do it with IPv6. 
That sounds very logical and makes a lot of sense today, but imagine hearing that in 1999 when there were seemingly plentiful IPv4 addresses and that you perhaps weren't buying the fact that the IPv4 addresses were running out next year or the year after that. And a lot of people did say those things. And here we are in 2014 and we still have some of them left in the air and free pool. Uh, two of the other regional internet registries have basically run out of their common free pool space uh, for distribution to internet service providers. And, and Aaron is uh, soon going to be behind them. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. So here's a little bit about IPv6 over time, and I'm going to talk about a few things here. Now, these are stats on IPv6 allocations and assignments directly from Aaron over time. But you see, we start the graph in 2006. There's a very good reason for that. And the reason is, is there's not a whole lot to show you from 1999 to 2005. Uh, it, would, it would all look like a little bit less than what you see in 2006 trailing all the way back uh, to, the, uh, to the left on this graph. But I want to talk about a few things in relation to IPv6 over the years and just kind of stick on this slide for a little bit. First thing, I'm curious, is there anyone in the room that participated inside the IETF processes in the mid-1990s uh, around the discussion of IPNG, IP Next Generation? Are any of you in the room? Hands. Yannick, of course, was involved in that conversation. Anybody else involved in that conversation? Well, back in the mid-1990s, there were some predictions made about the depletion of IPv4. And remember, in the early 1990s, we were issuing address space classfully. We weren't really using CIDR yet. Uh, not many people were using NAT. Uh, we were just basically issuing class C's, class B's, and uh, quite a few class A's uh, got out too, as you can see uh, in the registry data. And looking at how we were actually distributing the IPv4 address space, it was very clear that we were going to quickly, quickly run out of IPv4 address space. And the network was growing much larger and more rapidly than a lot of people expected that it would. A lot of people have described it as an, exper as an experiment actually escaping the lab. They didn't realize that the internet would turn into what it is today. And IPv4 wasn't actually designed for what the internet is today. It was really designed to be an experiment. It was for government use, research use, and those types of things. So the Internet Engineering Task Force knew in the mid-1990s that they had to do something about numbering. And they knew they had to do something fast. So they started doing a few things. One of the things that they did is they created CIDR, uh, classless interdomain routing, so that we could issue blocks to networks outside of the classful ranges, A, B, and C. And we all are familiar with that today, and we do that today. So that's one thing that extended the lifetime of IPv4 quite significantly. Um, another thing that they did uh, inside the IETF in the mid-1990s is they created uh, uh, RFC, RFC 1918, basically the 10 network and some other networks that you could use over and over again in many different networks across the globe and actually do network address translation. Um, a lot of people are unhappy that that happened, but it did extend significantly the lifetime of IPv4 as well. But while all, as all of that was going on, they were also uh, talking about the next generation of IP. And in the end, they created IP version 6. How many people here participated on the 6 bone? I got one, two, three, four, five, six hands. Thank you very much. Because basically what you did is you used IPv6 in a beta phase, and you did some spectacular things to actually get the registries ready for issuing production grade IPv6 address space. And it was the work that you did, along with the IETF, that did some pretty significant things. So if you were on the six bone, you had uh, something from a 3FFE prefix, and you were using that address space, and you were experimenting with it, and you were providing your feedback uh, back to the standards makers. And a lot of the work that you did actually contributed to the first policy documents that the regional internet registries put in place to distribute that resource. So that was a quite significant effort. Now, of course, of course the uh, six bone was closed down shortly after uh, IPv6 went into production, but uh, that was a very significant part of uh, IPv6 history. So in 1999, there's a few things that happened. 
One of the things that happened is that the IETF through the IAB, the Internet Architecture Board, they made a delegation of IPv6 address space down to the IANA, to the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority. They took a slash three and they delegated it to the IANA for the specific use and purpose of issuing down to the regional internet registries who would service the address space needs, IPv6 address space needs of their communities. So they took one eighth of the entire IPv6 address space and delegated it down to the IANA. And that slash three is still at the IANA today with pieces of that slash three that have been delegated down to the RIRs for distribution to you uh, inside our regions. So that leaves seven eighths of the IPv6 address space that has not been touched. It's still with the IETF, with the IAB, and it has not been delegated to anyone. We're only working with one eighth of the total IPv6 address space right now at the IANA and inside the regional internet registries. And it was the thought at the time that that delegation was made is that, you know what? If we make some mistakes in how we distribute this address space or how we use this address space or what we do as a community with it, the most damage that we can do is one eighth of the IPv6 address space. And we still have the other seven eighths and we'll do something different with that um, if we find out that something went wrong. And as far as I'm concerned, there's a lot of things that are going right today with that one eighth of that IPv6 address space. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that too. Another thing that happened in 1999 is the IETF recognizing that they make the standards and then they had these other bodies that actually manage the distribution and their communities actually make the policies for the distribution of those resources. The ITF sent representatives to the RIR meetings. At the time, there were only three RIRs. There was Aaron, uh, APNIC, and RIPE NCC. And we actually had people from the IETF coming to our meetings explaining what the new protocol was like and how it was to be used and how it was set up. How many people here remember uh, Sub-TLA, TLA, NLA, SLA uh, addresses. So in the, in the very early days, the way that the protocol was described is that end user organizations could not get IPv6 address space directly from the registries. They would only be able to get them from the organizations that were providing their connectivity to the internet, their internet service providers or carriers. And the way that the address space was split up for distribution was if you were a really, really big provider and you came to the registry to get address space, you would get something called a TLA uh, or a sub-TLA. And then you would take, if you had downstream internet service providers who are using you primarily for their connectivity, they would give you something called an NLA. Um, I can't remember where exactly the A was in the RFC, if it was actually, people have called it next level aggregator or next level address, it was one or the other. And then below that was SLA, site level address, where an organization who was a customer, an end user of an ISP would actually get that size of address. And those were fixed size addresses uh, that were going down uh, to organizations. And with those guidelines, uh, many people inside the uh, addressing communities, people inside this room, I recognize some of you, and a lot of the people who were active back then came together and created the provisional IPv6 policy documents that we're going to manage the distribution of the address space. And that document also came out in 1999. And after all of that was done, the RIRs made their very first allocations of IPv6 address space. In April of 1999, it all got started. And months following that, we started issuing blocks to organizations that came in to request them. The uh, first organization that got IPv6 address space from Aaron uh, the first two organizations that got IPv6 address space from Aaron is an organization in California and an organization in Canada. And uh, it doesn't actually reflect that way today in the, in the uh, historical database if you go back and you look for it. And the reason why that is is because one or two of them, they came back and returned the address space they had originally gotten because the policies changed a few years later and got a larger block. So you can't actually see that they were the first uh, people who received the IPv6 address space in North America. But it was a very interesting time and it was a learning curve for all of us. And it was uh, really good. So, just, you see that spike in 2011? How many people here know what likely caused that spike in 2011? 
How many people will think it's something other than World IPv6 Day? Yes. What's the, you think it's World IPv6 Day? What was it in 2011? What's that? February 3rd. February 3rd? There's a large allocation. Oh yeah, that was, that was one of the big events that happened in February of, uh, of 2011. This is a real cute in audience, I'm telling you. So one of the things that happened in, Fe in uh, February of 2011 is the IANA, who is distributing the, as well as the IPv6 space, the IPv4 space down to the RIRs, they had made their last allocations of IPv4 address space down to the regional internet registries, their very final ones. So starting in early 2011, the RIRs had their final blocks of IPv4 to issue down to you inside the communities with no opportunity for us to ever go back or get and get more. Well, what's happened since then is some people have done the unbelievable thing to many of us and actually said, for the good of the internet, I'm returning my IPv4 address space because I don't need it anymore. And they return nearly up to a slash eight in some cases. And that address space ultimately went back to the IANA. And then re here recently, the IANA started splitting that up and issuing it back down to the RIRs. So if you're following the, uh, the actual scale of how much IPv4 address space Aaron has left, you'll notice that it bumps up every once in a while, or it has twice over this last year, and that's because we got more address space from the IANA. I don't think we expect any more of that to happen unless someone in the room here or someone watching online decides to return another slash eight to the uh, free pool for IPv4. I don't expect that'll happen as much today as it did in the past, but that's one of the things that happened in 2011. And there were also some other events that I'm gonna talk about here in a few minutes that happened around that time. So, IPv4 developed um, for the original internet, the ARPANET, 1978. It's got just over four billion addresses. Uh, it's everywhere, we all use it every day. Anyone who's connected to the internet uses IPv4 somehow. And it's allocated within our regions based on documented need. Now that we're in, we're very close to depletion, you know that it's not very easy to just come in and get your IPv4 addresses. There are policies that are very closely followed. And we actually have uh, practices in, uh, in place right now so that when we do hit those, the last slash 12, the last slash 13, the last slash 14, that we're actually receiving those requests and answering them in the order that they were received. So that if two people on the same day put in a request for that last slash 12 or last slash 13, and we're looking at their responses as they come in and, and we're issuing them out in the order that they came in, uh, somebody's gonna get the 12 or the 13 and then the other person's not. So what we're doing is we're being very careful, first in, first out, and we're actually in a phase where we have to do that because within the next couple of days to weeks, on the long end months, we're gonna hit the first time in history of the registry system in this region where someone comes in to request a block of IPv4 address space, and they actually justify that block according to the policy set by the community, and they will not get that block. Not because they didn't justify it, but because it doesn't exist. It's no longer available. That's gonna happen for the first time before you come to this next event next year. Um, there's no way around it. I mean, if you look at how much address space we have right now, we have 0.69 of a slash eight remaining. Um, it's it's going to go pretty quickly. I heard somebody in the audience say yes. I think there are a lot of people here excited about that. There are a lot of people that are very worried about it too. Uh, but it is what it is. And we've been talking about this for well over 10 years. And it hasn't just been Aaron that's been doing this. I mean, it's... Uh, you know, we've played our role in making sure that people know and we're aware of the fact that IPv4 is actually depleting and that IPv6 is the future of the internet. But well before we became actively engaged in campaigns to raise that awareness, there were other people uh, shouting it very loudly uh, inside forums and in other spaces. And I know there are people in this room because I recognize you that were doing that very early on. More than 10 years ago, you were at forum meetings IPv6 forum, the task forces that, stand, uh, that stood up alongside the IPv6 forums. 
There were some individuals that did an enormous amount of work um, back in the uh, early last decade. It was amazing everything that they were going through. And I have a great deal of respect, and a lot of people have a great deal of respect for all of that work that all of you did. Um, but all of us collectively, we've been talking about this for a very long time. And uh, just like you said at the table here in the front, um, it actually, things that we've been talking about all these years finally started to happen. And in February of 2011, there we were. There's the five RER CEOs uh, uh, plus uh, uh, head of ICANN and the head of IANA uh, standing on a stage holding a plaque that actually is their last and final slash eight that their registry would ever get of IPv4 address space. That was a very historical moment. It, it signifies the end of the protocol that helped us get all this started. And we're in a transition right now and we're going to realize full deployment of IPv6 one day. Um, but that was an interesting time. And it, we have even more interesting times in front of us. So these are slash eights. These are measured slash eight. IANA IPv4 space and slash eights. You can see back in 2006, 62 slash eights and down to 59. March of uh, 2008, the month before the first ever Rocky Mountain IPv6 summit occurred, because I believe that happened in April of 2008, we had 41 slash eights remaining of IPv4 address space. And that quickly depleted over the years down to February of 2011. Now, one of the things that you may have heard of is we've set up these phases of depletion that we would go through. One of, one of you know, the first phase is that we get our final slash eight from the IANA. And then there were some phases uh, between there and where we are now in phase four of IPv4 depletion. Phase four, the trigger for phase four, this is the final phase. We're in the final phase of IPv4 depletion. That trigger was when Aaron's IPv4 free pool fell below a single slash eight. And uh, we actually hit that on 23 April of this year. And right now, this picture was just taken, I think, the other day. We were at 0.7, we're at 0.69 this morning. We're at 0.69 slash eights. And if you click on that little counter there that shows how much address space that we have left, it'll bring you to the number of prefixes that we have left in, in each, uh, each one of those. Um, it updates daily, keep an eye on it. If you need more IPv4 address space and you could justify it today, it's probably a good idea to submit your request and get that in. Uh, we realize as a registry that the processing time for IPv4 requests has increased quite a bit over the last couple of months. And the reason why that is, is because we have to review the, the requests and responses first in, first out. They have to be sent back and responded to serially. We have to make sure that we're not letting anyone jump in front of line from someone else because we might be talking about issuing the final of a certain prefix uh, in, inside that transaction. And uh, on top of that, no longer can a single analyst review your request for IPv4 address space. It has to be team reviewed. There has to be agreement on the response that's being sent out because we're actually sending out a response that will tell someone here very shortly, no, you don't qualify, you don't get it, and the next person did, and they get it, and it was the final prefix of the size that they requested. So we're being very careful about this, but what it's doing is it's increasing the processing time for IPv4 requests. If you're requesting an AS number, you're requesting IPv6 or some other type of service from Aaron, you'll find that that's within our normal turnaround time, but the IPv4 requests are gonna take a bit longer, and I hope you can understand why. So, how many people in the room already have IPv6 address space issued directly from Aaron to them? If you could please raise your hand. So that's about half the room. For the half of you that don't already have IPv6 address space directly from the registry, one of your first steps is to get the address space to deploy IPv6. For many of you who are already paying a fee to the registry for your IPv4 address space, or uh, you're gonna find that you don't see an increased fee for IPv6. So basically the way the fee schedule works is that 
you don't pay for both IPv4 fees and IPv6 fees, you just pay for the greater of the two holdings. So you have a really, block of IP, really large block of IPv6 and a very small block of IPv4, uh, you just pay that one fee a year for the IPv6 and then the flip of that. So for many of you in the room, it's possible, if you go take a look at the Aaron site, if fees are one of the things that you're concerned about and you take a look at that, you may find that there are no additional fees at all for you to register the IPv6 address space. And the community actually set it up that way on purpose uh, so it wouldn't be an impediment to you coming in and getting your IPv6 addresses. So, how many people here have already deployed IPv6, please raise your hand. Excellent. How many people here uh, have a plan but they haven't deployed it yet? So that's about half the room that doesn't have a plan. I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand if you don't have a plan. That wouldn't be cool, I'm not gonna do that. But I paid attention to the hands that went up. Um, you need to start looking at this. This is real. Um, you're not gonna be able to get IPv4 address space from the register any longer to continue growing your network and your services to your customers. It's just not gonna be possible. It is not gonna happen. Uh, the place that you get IPv4 today might not be the registry, and I understand that. It might be your upstream internet service provider that's very happily giving you slash 24s or 23s or 22s or whatever it is that you need over the years. I promise you, they're gonna be less willing to give those to you going forward. In fact, if you have large holdings from them, I would not be shocked, and you shouldn't be either, if they come back to you and do an audit of what they've given you in the past and start asking for some of that back. That type of thing has already started happening, and it's gonna happen even more going forward. You need to put your plan together for IPv6, how you're gonna continue on the network into the future, and it will involve IPv6. There's just no way around it. Now, a lot of people didn't believe that just a few years ago. I mean, we would go out, I know there's, there's some of you here that I've actually conducted outreach events with in the past, and uh, I know that some of you have done quite a bit of outreach yourself in the past, trying to get people to a point where they understand that you, know, you really need to you know, get something done here. You need to start moving on IPv6. But in the very, in the very early days, there were so many people that didn't believe IPv6 would ever get off the ground. They just thought it just wasn't possible, it was never gonna happen. And there's still a few people that believe that today. When Aaron started doing uh, some aggressive outreach, probably 2007, 2008 timeframe is when we aggressively started doing outreach, where we would do booth events, and we would do a lot of speaking engagements and things like that. Our community came to us and said, get off your, get, get going. Start talking to people about this. Do everything you can to make sure everyone hears this until they're all sick of it. And some of you in the audience are probably sick of it today. Uh, well, maybe not you guys, because you actually came to an IPv6 conference, and I think that's great. But when we, when we started uh, in 2008 doing these booth events, we would go to a show like INET, or uh, the Consumer Electronics Show, or some other event. We would have a, a 10 by 10 booth stood up, and we'd be sitting there, and people would come by and ask us, what, what, are, you do, what are you doing here? Um, you don't have any competition. You're, you're a nonprofit public trust organization. You technically don't have anything to sell. Why are you here? And we would, we would explain to them, we're here to raise awareness of IPv4 depletion and to let you know that, that you must start looking at IPv6 if you plan to be on the network into the future. And I kid you not, maybe some of you, some of you in the room I know actually stood on those booths with us back then, but there were people that laughed at us. They actually laughed at us. There, the denial was so strong, even in 2008, that it was mind boggling. Um, people would say, you're wasting your time, uh, you don't need to be here, IPv6 is never going to happen. Uh, they would uh, say all of these things. But slowly over time, uh, not just because we were getting the word out there, but because events like this one were happening, and the work that all of you were doing at other events and inside your own communities started to spread the word and get the message out there. And then uh, about two years later, it turned from around 2010 from straight up denial to, okay, um, yeah, I know I need to get something done. Um, it was like acceptance, right? But they weren't happy at all. Because a lot of the people we were talking to, they thought IPv6 probably is gonna happen, but you know when it's gonna happen? after I'm out of this industry. 
after I'm retired and I don't have to do anything about it. And we heard that from a lot of uh, executives, chief level position people, um, executive directors inside organizations. They would actually come and directly ask us the question. They wanted us to pinpoint the year where if they hadn't done V6 yet, where it would be a problem for their company. And we couldn't give them an exact date of when that was, but we would give them an estimate of around when that might be. And I actually had people say to me, good, I'll be retired then. And they would make it very clear that their company would not be doing anything with IPv6 before then. I, people were actually making personal decisions about deploying IPv6. Um, if, you, if you're in this room and you've heard this yourself, raise your hand. It's amazing, but there are people putting their own companies in jeopardy, the future of their companies in jeopardy, because they didn't want to tackle this technology challenge. We're all in this together. It's something that we need to do. If you're in the room today and you haven't put together, put together a plan about how you're going to start moving towards IPv6, start doing it now. It's very important to your company. Well, how, you know, how do you get started? I know a lot of you don't need to hear this. Some of you in the room might need to hear this. If anything, if you don't need to hear this, at least be aware of this is what Aaron is telling other people, just so you know. So we're telling people, well, we know that you can't just cut off of IPv4 right now. I mean, keep, keep your services up on IPv4 right now. Dual stack, also do V6. Start making some incremental additions of V6 in places inside your network, uh, on, on the edge, servers, things like that. And we're trying to be very clear to them that they have to move soon and they need to get started with this. Now, a lot of the internet service providers, the carriers and stuff like that, they've already done what they've needed to do years ago. The operating system guys, they did what they needed to do very early on. You know, all of this stuff happened. The consumer electronic vendors have finally gotten on board and most of them are moving in the right direction. A lot of it because of pressure put on them by some of their largest buyers, customers. Um, but a lot of that stuff's there. A lot of you, if you're running a production network, providing services to customers for access, you're tuned into V6 probably already. And you've got your plan, you're moving forward. You might be up one of the people on the charts showing 25% of all your traffic going to Google is over V6 or something like that, and that's wonderful. But you, you know where we're really lagging is um, a lot of the enterprise organizations out there uh, because they consider this to be their internet service provider's problem, not their problem. And a lot of the um, content uh, uh, companies, a lot of the people who are in the content space only, that, you know, basically I have, I have a website and there's a service on this website and people come and they use it. I've got content. Um, I've got an app that runs over the, you know, run, runs over the network and they, they, you know, hit it over the web. A lot of them, uh, they also think that they've got a lot more time left. They've got a lot less time than they think. If you're in here and you're, and you're primarily content, you've got to get moving too. You've got to get yourself up there because you know, one of, the, one of the, last, the last two pieces that we're gonna discover where we need to make a lot of traction to make, you know, create a situation where we can start subtracting IPv4 from the network and subtracting support for IPv4, it's gonna be the enterprise organizations and, and it's gonna be the content folks. And so if, you're, if you have a relationship with them and you're talking to them, make sure that they need to do something about that. I was, I was really real happy about how you attacked that uh, topic uh, yesterday, Tom, especially about the enterprise organizations. I agree, it's very important, uh, and we got to get the content folks moving too. So, so you're going to continue to need IPv4 for the foreseeable future. You know that. Um, if you need IPv4 address space, we still have some at Aaron. Come get it. If you can justify it, make sure that you do that. If you need to do that but don't neglect your IPv6. Make sure that you get all the IPv6 address space you need to get yourself started. And the good news is there's plenty of IPv6 address space if you need more later. There just is. And um, I don't want to have like a, one of those moments where somebody makes a prediction and they have to eat crow like 10 years later, but I don't think that'll happen. I don't think anybody in this room is going to have a depletion problem with IPv6. Um, Somebody in this room is going to invent a new way to do routing on the internet that doesn't need IP addresses probably before you run into a problem with IPv6. That's just my thought. But um, here we go. 
So these are all the types of things that we're asking people to do to put together their plan, things to look at to get ready for IPv6. We want them to audit their equipment and their software, encourage vendors who aren't already doing it to support IPv6. It really makes a difference when the vendors get telephone calls or emails from their customers saying, I, I need you to be IPv6 ready and I want the same type of support in V6 that you give me in V4 because uh, up until a few years ago, a lot of the vendors were saying, I don't have any customers talking to me about this, I'm not gonna do it. And that probably wasn't true, but what they were really saying was, only 1% of my customers are coming and talking to me about this, so I'm not gonna do it. Uh, but I think a lot of them have come around already, and a lot of it had to do with you guys contacting them and letting them know what you needed. And I, I would encourage you to continue doing that, by the way. If you, if you have a vendor out there that doesn't support V6 the way you need it to, and it's probably not the vendors that are here in the hallway uh, today, because these guys have worked their asses off as companies to get themselves prepared and ready to provide services to you guys and all of your peers going forward. But there's some vendors out there that still need to do some things. If you come across one and you discover something, let them know about it. Let them know about it in an email, call them on the telephone, do it on Twitter, do it anywhere that you want, but let them know about it, it's important. And if you know that you're gonna have to do a large scale V6 deployment, get your staff trained. I mean, there's a lot of resources online that they can find and they can learn things themselves. But if you need to send them somewhere to get training, send them somewhere to get training. It is worth the investment. If you need to hire someone, maybe it's somebody in this room, to actually come to your company and actually provide training to your lead staff, do it. And if you think that's a good idea, I would encourage you to find those people today before this meeting ends and have a conversation with them about how you might be able to set that up. It's, um, it's, a, it's a very important thing that you get ahead of. Um, we give a lot of presentations to governments, so this is in here. How many people are in here with the government? All right, wow, more than I thought. Um, U.S. government has done a lot of work over the years. A lot of you here in this room, I recognize some of you, uh, your faces, have actually done quite a bit of work to um, help the U.S. government, for instance, understand that they had a role to play here. And you actually made some very significant things happen over the years. The United States government mandate for IPv6 deployment. It kind of shifted over the years what that meant, but they did something about it and they put together an effort and they went through and other people paid attention to that. And it's one of the things that made IPv6 a reality to a lot of other uh, entities out there. And I think that was very important. They updated the federal acquisition regulations. Basically stated if you're, if you're a federal agency and you're gonna be issuing a contract for any type of network services to a company, it's required that they be IPv6 capable or you can't issue them a contract unless you get a waiver from the GAO. They actually put that in the, the federal acquisition regulations. And there are people in this room that actually helped them move towards that decision. It was very significant. That made a, that made a big deal uh, over the years. But there's a lot of things that other governments can do. There are a lot of places in the world where IPv6 just hasn't really taken hold yet, and, and there are some things that people can do to, to help move us forward inside that space. So, there's a checklist that you can look at of some things that you could do. Uh, there's some places that you can go to to get more information uh, about this. Uh, we've, we got a wiki that we stood up many years ago. It's called getipv6.info. If, if you've ever seen those oval IPv6 stickers, the white oval IPv6 stickers, we had no idea that those stickers would be that popular when we first made them, but we, we have to print boxes of them all the time because we can't keep them in stock. People love those stickers. That's the website that's on the, that particular sticker. And what that is is a wiki where people have gone over the years and uploaded their own information about IPv6 deployment. There's some good information there. I would encourage you to go check it out. Some of the stuff might be dated because it started so long ago, so you, you have to look at that and judge for yourself uh, what you want to consume. But uh, do know that that's there, and do know that all of you collectively created that. And the reason why we used a wiki to do deployment is because the Aaron community came to us and said, you shouldn't put together IPv6 training yourself, and you shouldn't go out and you shouldn't train people to deploy IPv6. You should be the registry, and you should di distribute the resource, and you should allow other organizations with the expertise and the will to do that to do that. So uh, what we did instead then is we put up um, a wiki and allowed you guys to upload there. 
And I know a lot of you have been successful providing IPv6 training to people, and that's great. Um, here's some operational guidance on some other sites that you could go to. Um, there's some there's some information at uh, Nanog. There's some information at the Internet Society. They have a program there called Deploy 360, where they talk about deployment of DNSSEC, IPv6, and now they're talking about secure routing uh, technologies there as well. And uh, DREN has some really good resources too. But before I finish, there was a few more things that I want to talk about here. And I think I'm doing pretty good on time. Yeah. The uh, one of the things that happened early on with IPv6 that just didn't taste good to a lot of people was some of the early policies. A lot of people didn't like the fact that um, it was very hierarchical, the distribution uh, model that was set up for IPv6, and it basically said you had to be a large ISP to get IPv6 address space directly from the registry, and everyone else would get it from you. And if you're an end user, you could never get address space directly from the registry. And there was a lot of concern in the IPv4 space at the time about um, lock-in and dependence on your provider when it came to IPv4. So, I mean, I understand what people were talking about, right? So say you're, a, say you're an organization that needs um, only, just a slash 24. I mean, you're a smaller organization, you need a slash 24. You deploy, you get that slash 24 from your upstream provider, you deploy that IPv4 slash 24 across your network. You might have some customers hanging off of that where you actually got uh, some addresses on their devices, that type of thing. If for whatever reason you decided you didn't want to use that provider any longer that you got that slash 24 from and you had to switch providers, one of the, one of the big things that was inside your uh, decision space was, well, do I actually want to do that renumbering? or may, would I just stay with that provider? And a lot of people made decisions like that. So there was a lot of concern about that inside the policy space. So what the policy community did inside the Aaron region and the other regions, uh, they came together and they made a decision that they were going to take a really hard look at the provisional policies that were set up for IPv6, and they made some very large and sweeping changes to the policy set. Over the years, one of those things ultimately meant that end user organizations could also come directly to the registry to get their IPv6 address space. So in 2008, I just want to say a little bit about this particular event. Um, I see Scott Hoaks sitting over there. Uh, so in 2008, Aaron actually had their, uh, a meeting here. We have uh, two public policy meetings per year. They typically happen in April and October. It's where the community comes together and they actually create the rule set, they create the policies that the registry uses to then distribute the resource out back to you. The only people who cannot participate in that process are actually the registry staff. I can't participate in that process. I can't speak to the merits of policy change or anything like that. But all of you, you make those decisions collectively and then we enforce those rules that you set. Well, we had one of those meetings right here in this hotel in uh, April of 2008. Uh, it was in the tower just across from the Starbucks and where the hotel is. And we had a really good meeting there and uh, we had heard that there was this, uh, this IPv6 event that was starting up and it was being called the Rocky Mountain IPv6 Summit, I think it was called. And uh, we, you know, we were very excited about that. And it was great because it was happening in the same town and we were in the same, uh, we were in the same area. And a few of us could actually go over there and check it out. And so uh, our meeting ended and we jumped in a cab and we uh, ran over to uh, University of Denver where the first one was held. And we were amazed at the number of people that showed up for this first time event that we had never heard of before. And uh, Scott and some others did a spectacular job of bringing people there and it was a great event. And this event has actually grown year after year after year. This is, this is one of the best IPv6 events that I've attended over the years. The organizers of this event and the sponsors uh, time and time again of this event have done a spectacular job of raising awareness of the need to deploy IPv6, providing resources to people, connecting companies who have services that they have in the V6 space for you and people who need those services. That's all very important. And, and this event has done a spectacular job of uh, doing that over the years. And if you see the organizers and you talk to the organizers over the coming day before you leave here, you should tell them thank you because uh, I think that, that it's contributing in a great way to IPv6 deployment. And I'd like to give them a round of applause actually. So.
One of the other things that happened over the last couple of years, how many people here participated in World IPv6 Day? Please raise your hand. All right, that's a good number of you. That spike that you saw in one of the earlier slides in 2011 where IPv6 registration just went through the roof there for a year, those are a result of IPv4 depleting at the IANA and largely, I think, because of that event, uh, World IPv6 Day. That drove a lot of interest in IPv6. Now, the, uh, the Internet Society um, was actually tagged inside that event, but really what they did is they, they facilitated you, the larger community, being able to come together and put together that event. It wasn't the Internet Society that did that. It was several people from operators and content companies, and some of you I, I can see by your face are actually here in the room. Um, that actually contributed to getting that event going, but it was a community-driven effort. There was a mailing list put together, and operators and content companies worked together, and they put together this whole, engineers put together this marketing pitch for IPv6 through this World IPv6 Day event, and you guys did an amazing job. And all the Internet Society did is they provided a platform for you guys to work from, they managed putting up the site, and. Um, all of those types of things, and then did a lot, helped with a lot of the promotion for it. But I, I think that big spike uh, also had a lot to do with that World IPv6 Day event. And all of you here that participated in that, you did something great. Uh, there was a follow-on event the next year. They did World IPv6 launch, and, and that created a little bit of a spike too. But you're seeing that the numbers are kind of lagging down a little bit in IPv6 on that graph that I showed you earlier. Let me go back to it and, and hit that. I do not want you to be discouraged by that. Um, that's not the one. There we go. You shouldn't be discouraged by this. Uh, over half of the organizations that are members of Aaron have come in and already gotten their IPv6 address space. There are more people holding IPv6 address today, address space today than you know. There's an enormous amount of allocations and assignments that are out there. People are doing their deployments. They're getting it spinning up. Um, the numbers have dropped off a little bit. I expect they're going to pick up again after we have, for the first time inside the next year, say, no, you can't have this block of IPv4 address space, not because you haven't justified it, but because we don't have it anymore. I think that that's going to have a big impact, too, and you're going to have a lot of these organizations coming in to get that. Start talking to your peers if you haven't already, and if you haven't done it yourself, get moving on IPv6. Everybody's doing it, and you should do it too. Um, and with that, I would like to thank everybody here for coming today and um, answer any questions that you have. And if uh, you don't want to ask me in front of everybody, we've got a booth sitting back there. We can answer any questions that you have uh, about IPv6 registration or the registry in general. So thank you. Any questions? We got a microphone in the room. Thanks, Augie. Uh, yes, thank you. Can you talk a little bit about IPv6 registration process, just real quick, so everybody knows? Sure. So, the community has set up policies for uh, IPv6 address space for both internet service providers and end user organizations. Uh, if you're an internet service provider and you want to come in and request IPv6 address space and you haven't before, if you already have um, IPv4 address space directly registered from the registry, that immediately qualifies you for the minimum allocation size of IPv6 address space. Basically what you would do is you would go to Aaron.net and uh, there's a link there for Aaron Online where you actually submit your requests for internet number resources. And there's a, what amounts to a form when you say request IPv6 resources that you would fill out and provide the information requested. And that comes to Aaron Registration Services staff. Uh, for IPv6 requests, usually within a day or two days, we'll be back to you with any additional questions that we have. But provided that uh, you meet the criteria for the IPv6 address space, you will be approved for IPv6 address space and get that. If you're an end user organization, the actual steps that you go through to request it are the same, but the policies are a little bit different. Um, if you already do have address space directly from the registry, that again qualifies you for the IPv6 address space as an end user. Um, you may have an intent to use the IPv6 address space that you get directly from the registry as an end user to multi-home with that, and that qualifies you for the IPv6 address space directly from the registry. 
Um, you may have a plan to issue IPv6 address space um, across your network in the near term that would qualify you for the IPv6 address space. As an internet service provider, especially if you're requesting the minimum allocation size, and as an end user that's actually on the network today with IPv4, uh, the policies are set up as such that it's a fairly simple for you to meet the criteria to get the B6 address base directly from the registry. And if you haven't done it yet, I would encourage you to do it because it's the first step to deploying B6 is getting the addresses, getting your own addresses. Any other questions? Got one right here. My, my understanding is that um, you've normally been reserving sort of an equal amount, if I get a slash 32, you take the next slash 32 and set it aside. Is that true? And is that something you're continuing to do when, when at least end companies make allocation requests? Um, for, for, IP, for IPv4 in the past, I know it's about V6 you're asking, but I'll get there. For IPv4 in the past, I think it's, uh, it's leaked out in the public in the past that we did that type of thing. Uh, where we would, you know, especially there was a policy back in the day where you would get a slash 20 for multi-homing and it would be stated that it would come from a slash 19 so that there was another slash, the adjacent slash 20 would be available for you if you were to grow. And, and that was common knowledge, even dating back to the late 1990s, early last decade. And so people kind of assumed that there were reservations that were happening for them, although we never explicitly stated outside of that policy that we did that for people. Um, today in IPv4, we can't make reservations for anyone. I mean, that's just not happening. Um, in the IPv6 address space, um, I have advisory council, former advisory council members. I have the director of registration services here, and I need you to tell me if I'm wrong here, but I don't think there's anything in policy that states we hold a reservation for someone in IPv6. Do I have that right? Leslie. Leslie, you got a microphone coming to you. Hi, uh, we are issuing slash 32s from a reserve slash 28. Okay, so we are saying that publicly then. So you've heard it here publicly, if you get a slash 32 from Aaron, you're getting it from a reserve slash 28. That's a lot of room to grow, it, it, it actually is. Any other questions? All right, I don't see any hands. Uh, this Augie, I was going to ask a question. Okay. Uh, how do we, most of us here are customers of Aaron, how do we get more involved with Aaron? I know you guys have meetings, mm -hmm. I think you travel as well, so how do we get more involved? So there's a lot of ways that you can get involved with Aaron. So everything that Aaron does is driven by the community. So we have two elected bodies at Aaron, actually there are three. Um, so one of the elected bodies is our board of trustees. So our board of trustees is elected by our membership. We have between four and 5,000 members uh, at Aaron. So any internet service provider that you can think of or a large inter uh, enterprise organization is probably a member of Aaron. And what they do is they come together once a year and they elect a board of trustees. Now the board of trustees, they have uh, th uh, three-year terms and they're staggered. So every year there are two seats up. Six of the board of trustees members are elected by the membership, the community. And one of them is basically hired by the other six to be the CEO of Aaron. So we have a seven member board. That, that board on the community's behalf, on the membership's behalf, governs the organization. They have the fiduciary responsibility to the organization and they have all of your best interests in mind in actually governing the organization. We also have a 15 member body called the Advisory Council. The Advisory Council uh, is another body that we've had at Aaron since the very beginning. Uh, Aaron uh, came into being in December of 1997. We're the successor registry to Network Solutions on the IP address space and autonomous system number side. And uh, one of the ways early on when we incorporated, we determined that we would decide how policies were created and how uh, technical advice was given to the organization would be through this advisory council. It's a 15 member body also elected by the membership in the community. And there's an election each year where there are five seats open. They also serve three-year terms and they're staggered. So we always have, always have 10 people that have been there for a while and we've got five new people. Those are two places where if you're interested in becoming involved in the governance of the organization or how we actually uh, create the policies and shepherd policies through the system uh, with the community, uh, you could run for one of those 
bodies. There's an election going on uh, here in the coming uh, weeks. Uh, it's actually happening in the coming weeks, so it's too late for you to get nominated because the nominations are already closed. But it's something that you can certainly do next year. If uh, you want to take a look at the slate of candidates for the Board of Trustees and the Advisory Council, go to Aaron.net. You can find that election uh, information page. And um, provided that you're a member of Aaron, and many of you in this room, I'm sure, are members of Aaron somehow, you can vote in that election. Um, the candidates, they've, they've actu they're actually making posts about what they want to do with Aaron. And whatever direction you want Aaron to go in, that's the person that you vote for. And so they actually do govern the organization through policy and through their fiduciary responsibility, respectively, on those two bodies. We've got an organizational staff. What we are is we're a secretariat. We're basically enforcing the rules that you set as a community to distribute the resources back out to you. And so uh, those are ways that you can get involved. The policy development process, the actual policies that govern how we distribute these resources out to you are created by the community at large. You do not have to be a, a member of Aaron to participate in that. Uh, there's a mailing list. It's called the public policy mailing list that anyone in this room can join. And you can become involved in the conversations that are going on about changing the policies. And I would encourage you to do that because it's very important. If you were ever came to Aaron and you requested something and you didn't get what you wanted, the reason why you didn't is because there was a policy that said Aaron couldn't do that for you. And uh, it's important that you know that you make the policies. The Aaron staff don't. So I would encourage you to get involved there. And we have two public policy meetings per year. We have one in April. That's typically a standalone meeting. And we advertise that. And you're welcome to join us in person or remotely. Anyone can participate in that remotely if they'd like. We stream it. And we have chat rooms available where you can ask questions and do all kinds of things. And then our other meeting in October is typically held in conjunction with the NANOG meeting. And uh, you're welcome to come there. And that's also uh, remote participation there is also available. And also policy process, public policy mailing list throughout the year. And um, at the NANOG meetings where we don't, where we're not having a joint meeting, we do have a consultation meeting. Uh, that's on the agenda where you can come talk about the active policy proposals. And you can really make a big difference. Just the, a few voices in this room could turn a discussion in another direction. It's quite amazing. Mm -hmm. And there are actually people uh, in this room that are currently on uh, the Aaron Board of Trustees. Um, we've got uh, Aaron Hughes over here. He's a current Aaron Board of Trustees member. Uh, we have a current Aaron Advisory Council member right here, uh, David Farmer. and. Um, we have uh, Stacy Hughes over here that was on the advisory council for many, many years and did some quite spectacular things, all of you, uh, to help govern and drive this uh, organization in the right direction. And uh, they're all volunteers. They don't get paid a dime to do what they do. And they all do it for you. I get paid. I'm the staff. So you shouldn't give me applause, but you should give them all applause right now. I think it's an important thing. That's it. Are there any other questions? Thank you very much.